Whenever we celebrate the sacrament of baptism here at FCCGE, as we often joyously do, we say that each one is named and claimed by God. Jennifer Louise, we might say, you are a child of God. You belong to Jesus Christ forever. It's a significant and sacred moment in their lives, and we are saying something important about who they are and whose they are. The scripture you are about to hear is about Jesus' own baptism at the hands of his cousin John. It's interesting to note that um, our four Gospels diverge significantly on important details of Jesus' life. Some events of his life are told in only one of the Gospels, some in two or more. But the most important facets of Jesus' life are told in different forms in all four of the Gospels. There are not many stories that fall into this category, that he was crucified and rose from the dead, that is in all four Gospels, that he shared a final Passover meal with his disciples, instituting what we call the Lord's Supper, that is in all four Gospels. And this, his baptism, is included in all the Gospels. And we, we might wonder why. Why was this event so important that all four Gospel writers made sure to tell it? Well, perhaps because his baptism established with absolute certainty his very identity as a beloved child of God, pleasing in God's sight. And perhaps, too, that it inaugurated his ministry of grace and healing and resistance to injustice. We don't know much about Jesus' spirituality before that day. We can safely assume that he was an observant Jew, that he attended synagogue, and that he observed festivals and holy days. But what we do know is that there came a day when he changed and decided to live more intentionally and passionately for God. We know that there was a day when he received a new identity, a new sense of who he was and what he was to be about. It was the day when he heard the voice from heaven and he knew himself to be God's child, the beloved. And we know that the power of his ministry was fed and refreshed and empowered by this very identity as a beloved child. Our scripture today is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 4 through 11. So John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And the whole Judean region and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the strap of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from the Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove upon him. And a voice came from the heavens, You are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen. Let us pray. Dear God, sometimes the news is so bad we don't want to hear it. And sometimes the news is so good we can't quite bring ourselves to believe it. So speak your word to us this morning, personal word, a word we need to hear, and startle us again with your amazing grace in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So strangers tell me things. 
I'm a Midwesterner born and bred, and nothing brought this home more to me than when Guy and I were first married, and uh, we moved to Vermont, and I found that I was very homesick. It wasn't that the climate of the weather was so much different than where I grew up. It was that the climate of the people was very different. I never quite got the hang of the Eastern Reserve. People were cordial, yes, but just not overly friendly. I hadn't put my, foot on, uh, my finger on it until one of our first trips home to Chicago with our newborn son. I remember I went out Christmas shopping and I experienced the strangest thing. People actually made eye contact with me. And they smiled and they commented on my beautiful child. Strangers struck up conversations with me. I, I remember thinking, ah, oh, I'm home. I was at a store one day doing some last minute Christmas shopping and an older customer couple struck up a conversation. They were chatting about the holidays and admiring my son. Uh, when the wife told me something that has always stayed with me, she explained that her son was grown and had a family of his own, but he was coming home for the holidays and she couldn't wait to see him. She said, enjoy your son. The time goes by so fast. You know, not one day goes by, she said, when I don't think this is my son, my beloved, in whom I am well pleased. As sleep deprived and hormonal as I was, it made me kind of weepy. I mean, what a gift. What a gift from a parent. What a gift to a son or a daughter. You are beloved. It's so important for us to hear and believe and to know. You are beloved. Now, I don't know if any of you are Downton Abbey fans. How many of you have seen, watch it? Yeah. Um, in one of the episodes, Lord Grantham, his good friend Shrimpy, a stuffy upper-class Brit, is leaving his wayward daughter with the Granthams for an extended visit. And he says to them, as he departs, I hope you'll teach her a little bit about the love of family. You know, love is a little like riding a horse or speaking French. If you don't learn it young, it's hard to get the trick of later. I think this is so true. Until we know love and let it seep into our being, it's hard to get the trick of later. Until we are loved, we cannot love ourselves, much less love other people. Being loved can creep into our very identity. It's my conviction that you and I our beloved children of God, that we need to feel that, need to know it, and live out of that knowledge. We need to claim it and live a life based on it. That is our spiritual task. Mary Ann Bird grew up knowing she was different. She was born with a cleft palate, and when she started school, her classmates made it clear to her how she must look to others. A little girl with a misshapen lip, crooked nose, lopsided teeth, and garbled speech. When her classmates would ask, what happened to your lip? She would lie to them and tell them she had suffered an accident because somehow that seemed more acceptable than to have been born different. She was convinced that no one outside of her family would ever love her. And then she entered Mrs. Leonard's second grade class. Mrs. Leonard was round and pretty and fragrant with shiny brown hair and warm, dark, smiling eyes. Everyone loved her. But no one came to love her more than Mary did. 
for a very special reason. You see, the time came that year for the annual hearing tests at school. They did this by employing the whisper test. Each child would go to the classroom door and close one ear with his or her finger while the teacher whispered something from the desk, which the child then had to repeat. Well, this time, Mary was the last to be tested, and she wondered what Mrs. Len Leonard might say to her. She knew from previous years that the teacher whispered things like, the sky is blue, or do you have new shoes? But when Mary's turn came, and she went into the hall, and she waited, Mrs. Leonard uttered the words that God surely had put in her mouth, seven words that changed Mary's life. Mrs. Leonard said softly, I wish you were my little girl. You are beloved. When I read our scripture story for today, I, I picture crazy John with his camel hair coat munching on locusts, standing at the Jordan River surrounded by people who were coming to him to get a fresh start. A mass of unwashed sinners crowding around, waiting their turn. The sun is beating down and the mosquitoes are buzzing. Children are screaming, all carrying with them things that they had done and things that they had not done. All carrying well-worn voices in their heads of why they were unworthy. The voices that the world conveyed about who they were and what they deserved. John's arms must have been tired from baptizing so many people. And then Jesus steps up for his own dunking. And then while things get crazy, the scripture says the heavens open up. No, not just open. Mark tells us that the heavens are torn apart. And then God speaks, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. What I love about this story is that God declares this to Jesus before he has really done anything. Think about that. God did not say, oh, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased because he has proven to me that he deserves it, that he has spent devotion time with me each morning and he reads his Torah, and because, boy, that guy can heal a leper. No, as far as we know, Jesus hadn't done anything yet, and still he was beloved the one in whom God was well pleased. These are life-giving words, life-changing words. They are words everyone should hear sometime or another, words we need to take into our souls. And you know what? What God said of Jesus is also true of you and me. You are a child of God. You are precious. You are beloved, Max Licato puts it this way. We are God's beloved. If God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. Writer and theologian Parker Palmer tells a story in his book, Let Your Life Speak. He says he talks about a time when he was struggling through a dark night of the soul. He was in a deep, deep depression, feeling worthless and hopeless. He said, amazingly, I was offered an immediate, un, unmediated sign of love when in the middle of one sleepless night during my depression, I heard a voice say simply and clearly, I love you, Parker. The words did not come from without, but silently from within, he says. It was a moment of inexplicable grace. And the thing is, we know, we know that the price of feeling unloved 
We know the price of feeling unloved of whole generations of folks who are undervalued and made to feel worthless. Just look at the atrocities being perpetuated around the world today. We know the price, and the price is violence and poverty and crime and, yes, war. We see this play out over and over again. In his famous letter, um, letter from the Birmingham jail, Martin Luther King Jr., who we will celebrate and remember tomorrow, responded to white ministers who asked him to slow down, to not press so insistently and stubbornly for equality and justice. Can't you be patient, the ministers asked him. King writes, when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers, when your tongue twisted as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park and see tears welling up when she is told that fun town is closed to colored children, and when you see the depressing clouds of inferiority begin to form in her little mental sky, when you are forever fighting a denigrating sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we can't wait. That denigrating sense of nobodiness, which was at the heart of King's leadership of the civil rights movement, was not only a passion for social and political justice based on the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, but it was a deeply held theological conviction, a deeply held biblical truth that human beings, every human being, regardless of color, race, station in life, nationality, income, or sexual orientation, every human being is a child of God called by name, precious and loved. Henry Nouwen puts it this way in his book, The Life of the Beloved. He said, being the beloved expresses the core truth of our existence. Though the experience of being the beloved has never been completely absent from my life, he said, I, I never claimed it. I never claimed it as my core truth. I kept running around it in large or small circles always looking for someone or something able to convince me of my own belovedness. It was as if I kept refusing to hear the voice that speaks from the very depth of my being and says, you are my beloved. On you, my favor rests. That voice has always been there, but it seems that I was much more eager, eager he said, to listen to other louder voices saying prove prove that you are worth something do something relevant spectacular or powerful and then you will earn the love you so desire he goes on to say that the voice that calls us beloved comes to us in countless ways through parents through friends and teachers students and the many strangers who cross our paths and show us love. Becoming the beloved means letting the truth of our own belovedness become enfleshed in everything we think or say or do. It means going out into the world to convince others of their belovedness too. In the 1944 film Gaslight, it was first shown in the United States in 1944. It was a thriller in which a seemingly genteel husband uses lies and manipulation to manipulate and isolate his heiress wife and persuade her that she is mentally unwell so that he can steal her money. He does this by secretly dimming and brightening the gas-powered lighting in their home.
But then he insists that his wife is just imagining it, making her think that she's going insane. It's taken nearly 80 years for the term gaslighting to make it into our common lexicon. But I think it so clearly describes this era of misinformation and truthiness, of making us question our own perception of reality and of being manipulated into accepting someone else's reality. That it is, it was actually named Miriam Webster's word of the year in 2022. Friends, don't let the world gaslight you into thinking you are nobody. Don't let the perceptions of others, the way you look, how you were born, who you love, where you are in life, don't let them let you think that you are anything other than a beloved child of God. Don't let the world gaslight you because you are black or an asylum seeker or Hispanic or Asian. Don't be gaslit because you are Jewish or Palestinian or because you are poor or old or young or differently abled. Or maybe for some of us, it's those tapes in our head. Don't let those old tapes in your head tell you you're not good enough. Those voices that tell you you have to be worthy enough to earn God's love and others' affection. That you have to prove your worth. Don't let those voices gaslight you. Don't let the world gaslight you into thinking that you are anything but beloved. Friends, God loves you. You, in all your messiness and ambiguity. You are fearfully and wonderfully made, the psalm says. God has your photograph on her refrigerator. Do you dare claim it? I'll end with a lovely poem from Sarah Speed called The Bravest Thing We Can Do. Trust your belovedness. Let it be a protest, an act of resistance, a song of celebration. Trust your belovedness in a world that is rarely satisfied. Wear it like a badge of honor. Speak it as confidently as your last name. Tattoo it on your heart. When outside forces chip away at your sense of self, when life asks you to hand over the keys, remember the water. Remember creation. Remember how it was good, so very good. Let this truth hum through your veins. Sing it so loud that it drowns out the weariness of the world. For the bravest thing we can ever do is trust that we belong here. Amen.